Hello, my name is Joy, and this is Craft Nomad Podcast, Episode 3. Today is Sunday, February 5th, 2017. You can find me on my website at craftnomad.com. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and that's all the social media. Mainly Instagram. I don't do Twitter very often, but occasionally I'm on there. I also have a fa- uh, page on Facebook called Chiang Mai Fiber Arts uh, Meetup Group. And that's for people who live in Chiang Mai, Thailand, where I live, and would like to meet up with other people who are interested in textile crafts. So um, if you're interested, take a look at those. Take a look at the website. Uh, My notes are on there. I do long-form notes. So um, if you have specific questions, go ahead and put them in the comments. I don't mind... uh, making a quick answer to something if it if you're not the type of person who really wants to read all the details. Uh, I'm just a better writer than I am a podcaster at this point, so you'll probably get more details in the show notes than you will uh, from the podcast. But this is my chance to sort of become a real person to you and hopefully meet some new people online who have the same interests, who are interested in crafts, who are um, also travelers, expats, or maybe even some people who um, live in the area. So uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about my knitting, uh, some travel, and some textile events that I attended, and also a local festival. And then I have a new section that's sort of a life hack, and I have to think up a new name for that, but um, things will happen little by little. Okay, so the knitting, um, I showed you in the last episode the um, knitted shell that I'm making out of the cotton linen fabric for the, the warm weather that we have here because I'm missing knitting and I haven't even worn a sweater since I've been here. I've worn a little crochet jacket and that's pretty much it. So um, what I learned this week was how to bind off for the arm size on either end of the knitting. And normally you start out and bind off a certain number of stitches and then you continue knitting as normal until you have one extra, or you continue knitting all the way across on the regular way, and then you turn it and you bind off the same number of stitches as you did before on the next row. But the dressmaker in me doesn't like that. It should happen on the same row. Plus, it makes the counting kind of crazy. I'm I like for the counting to be the same on both sides. Otherwise, I get really confused if it's something much more complicated than what I'm doing now. Um, But it's just nice for it to be symmetrical. So I went online. I found a tutorial that showed how to do it. And uh, the first time, it was really awkward because you have to hold, you have to hold the, um, you're working yarn or thread in one hand and you have to hold the thread that you're going to travel you have to trap it in your stitches you have to hold that and at the same time so my stitches seemed all loosey-goosey and weird but it turned out okay and so I did another row and another bind off And it was much easier, and I thought, oh, this is great. Guess what? I forgot what she said about doing it just a little bit looser because I was so happy I wasn't dropping the thread all the time. But it came out kind of tight. I didn't rip it back. I just figured, you know, I'm learning. It's a simple top. It's not going to matter that much when um, when I'm finished anyway. 
and I learned something new this week. So uh, I'll try to just, uh, you know, bring up the knitting or whatever project I have when there's something really happening. And since I'm only posting every couple of weeks, there'll usually be something short about that. Um, on the less happy note, I tried to buy a sewing machine. I did buy a sewing machine since the last time I talked to you. It worked for like two days, really only like a couple of hours. And then it stopped working and I did everything, adjusting all the tensions and checking my bobbin went online and found the manual. It's it's an old singer and I had to actually call the singer company and they were great. They found um, the Thai model that matched the American model and sent me a PDF of the um, the user's guide. So I went all through that to make sure it wasn't something that I was doing wrong and it just wasn't working and I posted some notes online and one really nice gentleman from London who is a sewing machine mechanic um, kind of confirmed what I suspected that either it just needs a tune-up and it'll be fine or because it's an older machine if it hasn't been taken care of very well and the major parts are worn out then a tune-up may not work because it will never hold. Sort of like if you try to tune a piano where the tuning pins are worn out, it just keeps sliding back out of tune. It would be the same thing with this. If the, the major parts are worn out, it wouldn't hold the settings. So in Thailand, there's no refund. There's no warranty on anything that's not new. And they wanted what I thought was too much money to do even try to fix it. And actually, after talking to somebody who's not local but has lived here for a number of years, I found that even though it seemed like a cheap price, they had really overcharged me. So the the upside of that is a friend of mine offered to take it to another place. Um, he has a truck where he could take it easily uh, to a little village that's just north of Chiang Mai where there are a lot of people who do that kind of work and it's in a shop now. I don't know what the progress is, but hopefully next week I will have the machine back and it will either work or it won't. So, I don't know if I'm going to keep it even if it works because it's been, it's like, you know, not a great feeling. So maybe I'll keep it until I see something more suitable online or, you know, and I can resell it. It would be fine if it, if it actually is repairable. If it doesn't work, there's nothing I can do except just get rid of it. Um, maybe save the table. Enough about that. I will let you know how it turns out by the next episode. I should know whether the machine works or not, and if it works, how happy I am with it, if I'm getting over my trauma, or if I decide that it's just a bad feeling. You know how if you ever had a car where it just has one thing after another wrong with it, when you finally get it fixed, maybe you just want to trade it in. That's kind of where I'm at right now. And really, truly, sewing machines are very cheap here. It's just that you have to be really careful where you go. So I won't say anything online, but if anybody's local who's thinking about buying a machine, you can certainly um, email me.
where it's private and I will give you my best advice about what to do about uh, purchasing a sewing machine, particularly if you're looking for a used one. Okay, the next section is about fun things, traveling and festivals and craft. So the first thing that I did was I took a trip with a very interesting group of people who were from all different places. So we had people from the U.S., people from Spain. I don't know what the third country. I think we had one other person who was maybe Canadian. Um, and we went to, uh, first of all, we went to the Sang Da Textile Museum. It's in Chongtong. And it's about an hour and a half um, outside of Chiang Mai. So you need some sort of transportation. We were lucky enough to be able to rent a van. And if you are local and you want to do this kind of thing and you have uh, a group of people, regardless of what kind of trip it is, you need at least six people usually to uh, get a van driver to take you out of town. But it's much nicer than going in a Songtao um, because it's comfortable seating. And I think you can take up to 12 people. It would not be as comfortable. Uh, we had seven, and we were all very comfortable. Uh, and everybody was interested in textiles who was on this trip. So we had one person who's uh, a designer who's starting her own business. Um, another person who's been a textile collector for many years who's very well versed in Thai textiles and she was the organizer um, and so she knows a lot about the textiles in in Thailand and many other collectible textiles she's been traveling the world most of her life and every country she begins to collect the local craft items, usually textile related. Um, so the Sanda Textile Museum was established right after World War II uh, by a lady who wanted to make sure that the textile industry in Thailand was brought back to the level that it was on before the war. So she started a small cooperative to create businesses for the local uh, weavers. And she did some sorts of in innovations, not, not turning it into a factory, but making it um, more easy to, uh, uh, to do business with the textiles. These, we're talking about the Hill Tribe, um, well, in this case, the traditional uh, Thailand cotton fabric. Uh, the cotton is spun and woven uh, at the museum still. Um, I'm not sure what what's happening with the cooperative. They also do the dyeing there. The granddaughter of the original founder is still there and she does all the dyeing and she gave us a little lecture about the natural dyeing that they use in the textiles. And uh, we were able to visit the original home of the owner. So a Thai um, home, a traditional Thai home, is on stilts. The house is upstairs. And then underneath the house, that's where they'll do their work. And so in this case, all of the looms are under the house. And it's very practical because... You're protected from the weather, but there's a nice breeze that goes through there, and it stays nice and cool. And then the upstairs is where you live, and your privacy is there. But if you're in a village and you have your workshop there, you're cool, you're comfortable, you can do your work, and you might be able to see what's happening in the neighborhood as you're working. So it's very pleasant. Um, so I would really recommend this. It's a really nice museum. It's in a beautiful setting in the mountains. Um, 
there's a river running by and you're welcome to bring a picnic with you. It's just really lovely there. The next place that we went was the textile uh, festival in Meichen. It happens once a year and that was another hour or so away and uh, it's in a small village. This year the festival was not really large and um, the lady who was leading it um, told us that it varies from year to year. So sometimes it has been really large and um, taking up the whole village and other years it's just been fairly small. But uh, it's an opportunity to see textiles handmade from the hill tribes that are all around the Changtong area. They come down from the hills once a year for this festival. So everything that you could purchase there is hand woven so you can buy yardage or you can buy um, finished clothing. If you like the traditional um, hill tribe clothing and you're of a size that can fit it. Unfortunately, I can't wear any of the clothes that are made here, but I, uh, I like to purchase the fabric and then make it into something that I can wear. Um, the fabric comes in lengths of about maybe seven yards, and they use one long length of fabric to make the traditional wrap skirt. Each tribe has a style, and this the style of the fabrics at, in this village is called Tinjok. And uh, I don't know a whole lot about the differences between all of them. All the traditional fabrics are indigo dyed, and then um, the, sorry, my screen went blank for a minute. Um, the traditionally dyed indigo, and then they have um, stripes of patterns around the bottom of the skirt, and that's where the different weaving patterns will come in. And if you're really knowledgeable, you'll be able to recognize which style it is and know um, what tribes they are. Um, and the tribes in northern Thailand can be um, strictly Thai, or they can be tribes that you would find in Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos, and Burma, because this whole area is kind of a border area, so you get a mix of, of the different uh, tribal traditions. Um, so I would suggest this trip as an overnight, because if you went straight to Mei Chen, it would take you two and a half to three hours, depending on traffic and the weather. And that's a pretty long day for something where you're not likely to stay more than a couple hours if that's the only thing that you're going to see. So I would suggest going early in the morning, uh, go to the festival, go to visit local temples and uh, other interesting things in the area. Just the drive is really beautiful and there are um, interesting places that you can stop just for sightseeing uh, for the geography. Then um, stay overnight and on your way back take the route that takes you through to Chongtong and visit the Songdae Textile Museum on your way and um, just plan a whole trip around that particular area because each area has lots of interesting things and the further you get from the bigger cities there are smaller things that you you won't find out about until you get uh, further out so uh, that's the traveling there was uh, something interesting that happened in Chiang Mai this weekend uh, they had the flower festival. And it usually happens the first weekend in February every year. There is a parade with floats 
that starts at one end of the city and goes right through the middle of town and ends at uh, Bunhard Park, which is the only park that's actually inside the old city. All of the uh, contestants who ha um, are showing their plants have booths all along the street, inside the park. It's totally decorated. There are all kinds of displays and, of course, contests about those too. But you can go inside the park and walk through all of the displays. And I'll try to put a few pictures of that in here as well. Uh, there's also one street that's just vendors. So if you're looking for potted plants to buy for your house or your apartment, it's a great time to buy them. Uh, the orchid competition was particularly the largest uh, of the competitions. It's a favorite flower, and uh, it was really interesting to just go through and see all of those kind of things. So if you're American, you've seen things like this happening at like state and county fairs. They'll have the area with the animals, but then they'll also have... Um, an area where they have displays of uh, plants and also um, decorating. So it's similar to that, but it's just fun to see all the different plants here because all the flowers are different and uh, everybody's happy, the kids are running around. So uh, that's the flower festival. and. That's all of the activity for the last couple of weeks. I would like to talk a little bit about the um, living as an expat. And I need to give a name to this section. It's something I want to talk about a little bit each time. Um, if you are an expat or if you know someone who is an expat who's been living overseas for a long time, I really want to talk to you about what friendship means because it takes on a different meaning when you move to a foreign country and it's a different culture, uh, a different language oftentimes. Your friends back home are really important to you. And the first year or so, everybody's really excited to email you, get cards, um, talk, chat with you on Facebook. And then they, but little by little, they go back to their normal lives. And of course, that's, you expect that. But um, what I would like to say is if you have a friend who's living overseas, of course, you have your life, but there's, they're still your friend. And it's more important than ever to them to keep their friends from back home. Because while they may be meeting new friends where they're living now, those friends have not been with them when they were growing up. Those friends have not lived within their culture and uh, understand some of the experiences they had. Um, you know, they're not interested in the news from back home. And... Everybody goes through a time when they uh, experience culture shock and they start to feel really isolated. And that, that happens a lot in the beginning, but it also that feeling sort of comes back sometimes. So I would urge you, if you have friends who are overseas, to continue to stay in touch with them. And don't just repost things on Facebook, but really make some contact, you know, uh, once a month or something so that they know that you're really still there and that you want to continue the friendship, whether it's on a virtual level or whether you're going to get a chance to see them when they come back or if you're going to visit them. Um, so I'm going to continue this topic for a few uh, episodes, I think, because Friendship is an important part of our lives, and I think that um, it's changed over the last 10 years, especially. And I think it's worth talking about it, especially for um, 
for people who live overseas, uh, I'd like to just let people know a little bit more about uh, what friendship means and uh, what the differences are when you just can't be there with the people who were very important to you before you moved to a foreign country. So that's all for today. I hope you enjoyed uh, watching and listening. And uh, I'll be back in a couple of weeks. In the meantime, happy crafting and have a wonderful life. Bye-bye.